All right, good morning, church. Please stand. We're going to begin our worship service here today with Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. 
to the greater Philadelphia, South Jersey region of the Greater Philly Church of Christ. It's good to be here today to worship God Almighty. To prepare our hearts for the communion service, we're going to sing Good, Good Father. All right, as we sing this song, just think about how good God has been to you in your life. Uh, we all come from different journeys, have our own different walks, and uh, this is a moment to realize how God intervened, how much he loved us, how much he cared for us, how much he knew, even before we knew where we were going to be, how much.
perfect in all of your ways to us. It's a love. It's a love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect, you are perfect in all of your ways. 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 You are perfect in all of your ways to us. It's a love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak peace so. Unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, 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 your good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Cecil Mott. I have the pleasure of just sharing a few words as we begin to take in the Lord's communion this morning. If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, we're going to be reading verses 26 through 30 this morning. Um, and this is interesting. As I was reading and studying this out, as I was reading about the Last Supper, I just kind of try to picture it. I don't know if you guys read the Bible and try to picture the scene in your head. And I thought about this as this is going on. You know, the disciples up to that point had known what it meant to celebrate the Passover. But then Jesus goes to some man, an unnamed man's house, with his disciples and calls them together to celebrate the Passover. But there was a couple of things involved. Number one, he said, you know, one of you guys is going to betray me. And I can only imagine being at the dinner, being at the table with Jesus, getting ready to celebrate something you've done all your life, and all of a sudden, the whole mood changes. Everybody's sad, and one person is out of his mind because he's got guilt. He's ridden with guilt. Then Jesus asked him right before this passage, you know, Judas says to him, you know, um, Jesus said, surely you do not mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. How would you feel that your friends, your leader, you know you betrayed them, they don't know it, but you know that he knows that it's coming. You know, so the whole mood has changed, and now Jesus is changing the whole thing. He's changing the whole environment, and he's changing it 
from remembering the Passover to now foreseeing what's going to happen to him and telling him, this is what I want you to do in remembrance, just like with the Passover. And um, in starting in verse uh, 26, he says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. When he had, and then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which is, poured out for, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from, this, from the fruit of this cup. So, excuse me. I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You know, Jesus had, uh, had set, it, set in point set up at this point almost a new ceremony. You know, he set a new ceremony. You think about it in life, we all have these ceremonies. We celebrate birthdays, baptisms, all these things. Why does Jesus, why did God do these things? Helps us to remember. You know, it helps us to remember what happened before. When I turned 50 a few uh, years ago, I guess I got I guess I got I got to be real. I'm on the podium here, you know what I mean? So I, uh, when I turned 50 a few years ago, there were a couple of questions that I reflected on. And I, and I know that, you know, we, I've had, obviously, 50 birthdays up to then, but this was the first time I asked certain questions. I really began to ask myself, is God pleased with how I raised my boys? They were grown men by then, you know? I, I think about the decision, even when I moved here to New Jersey, I just, you, you begin to reflect back. You begin to examine, and I began, and two things happened. Not only did I reflect back, but I began to examine moving forward, what kind of promises will I make to myself and to God? What am I going to do with the remaining, I think, over half my life's gone. What do I do with the remaining 30 years? Things like that. So these times that Jesus set up with communion are not only a time for us to look back, to remember what Jesus had done for us. Remember, it, in the same way these ceremonies are set up, Jesus calls us to reflect, to remember what he's done for us, to remember the sacrifice that he made, to remember the blood that he spilt, to remember that his body, that we are one body, despite what the world tries to tell you, despite what outside influences try to get you to go a certain way, we need to remember. And I thought about why is this so important? Because we forget so easily. We forget so easily. We read throughout the New Testament how the Israelites constantly see Jesus, see God doing things, pulled you out of dark trouble, but a day or two later, we right back where we started, you know? We have ceremonies in our life so that we can remember birthdays, holidays. We want to remember special days. And that's what this communion is all about. When I say, when we talk about reflecting, I would think about the words uh, in, um, in how we reflect. I would think about the words written in 1 Corinthians. If I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 11. So it does come heavy. Jesus doesn't take this time very lightly. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, he says, So anyone who re eats bread or drinks of this cup, of the Lord in an unworthy, oh, excuse me, excuse me. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating, that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. That's kind of a loose translation, but in 11, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, he gives us some warning. So Jesus takes this time very seriously, and I would ask that all of us take it seriously as well but not in a solemn way. Look at it as a time to cleanse your heart, to examine your heart, to look back, you know, is God pleased with what I've done? Are my thoughts, the thoughts on par with what God's thoughts would be? So it's neither the bread that's, of, the bread is needed, but it's not the center. The cup or the juice is needed, but it's not the center. The center is your heart. The center is your spirit and your soul. The center is what Jesus did for us on the cross. So as we take the communion, let us take time to reflect and let us take time, let us take time to remember and to um, look forward. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you this morning for opportunity to just to say a few words before we participate in the drinking of uh, the juice and the eating of the bread, Father God. Father God, I just pray for our family of believers here, God, that you would just, that we would just connect with you even more often. 
And as we learn more and more about prayer, Father God, that we can commune with you often and more deeply. Father God, that our faith will not fail us in times of uh, hardship and when the world gets hard around us. But God, we thank you for your sacrifice. We know that you wouldn't give us more than we could take. But God, we know it feels like it sometimes. But God, just give us a little more of your spirit, as we would say. We love you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you don't have a communion, could you please raise your hand? That concludes the communion portion of our service. The song, song, the singers can come back up. All right, once again, good morning, church, and let's stand. We're going to sing a, a song here, and for those of you who uh, were at the conference, and for those of you who uh, watched it online, uh, I want to call it a phenomenal thing, but it wasn't a phenomenal thing. It was, it was just, uh, I mean, the work of the Spirit is, is truly indeed a phenomenal thing, but it was the work of the Spirit for sure. And you may recall that when they were singing on Sunday, the microphones and the sound went out. <laughs> there was a moment, a brief moment of silence, but then what happened? Everybody sang. The church sang. Yep. They didn't need people up here with microphones yep. doing it. The church sang. Let's see. The glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praise. 
Jesus of the King. Rise among us, let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise.
Guys, it's good to be with you this morning. And uh, I don't know about you guys. I hope you, who, all those who went down to Florida, I hope you have recovered and you've been inspired. And I hope that the church, I don't know how many got together, watched it, uh, viewed it online. Uh, but it really was an encouraging time to see our churches come back together. Uh, I was always down there joking around, so I have a cynical sense of humor, and I was like, oh, man, I really appreciate the church putting together a COVID super spreader. Um, come on, guys. You got to be – <laughs> well, sure enough, a bunch of folks got COVID down there, right? So, but, uh, hey, that didn't stop God from doing what he was doing. It was still an inspiring, encouraging time. And, uh, guys, I hope um, that you get – back online and get to hear some of those lessons and and uh, get just kind of get uh, you know up to date of what's going on just around the world with the church and so it's been encouraging and today we're going to continue in our, our sermon hopefully so you know we do have the, the the beauty of things starting to work today you know how I talked about a few weeks ago that changing over the system and it just seemed like nothing ever worked we are 90, what, 5% there, something like that. We're getting really close, 95. I mean, it's been since we come, it's almost been a year, so it's been awesome to see that we're coming this far, that all the screens are on, okay? And then hopefully by next week, we can actually have the lyrics up. And then we won't, we won't know what to do. It would, be, it would be so smooth. It would be awesome. So uh, and we're going to continue in prayer. You know, we've taken this whole summer and praying, and it's been really encouraging just to speak to some of you and to hear how you guys have been praying together, just hearing some of the answered prayers, even the struggles and challenges we go through, just to hear the peace that's in the hearts of the disciples, because they're praying, and they know that something great and bigger than themselves has got them. And uh, just hearing the stories, I really want to encourage you as a congregation, share your story. Share the story of God answering your prayers because it inspires and encourages us in our faith and in that con desire to continue to pray fervently has, like we had been all summer. And I thought it was awesome that this was the idea. Let's just take this summer, no agenda, but let's just pray as a, as a church. And, you know, this is not something I want us to let go as a region because we are starting to come and land the plane that, to say, per se, on the summer focus on prayer and all the lessons. I know we've been focusing on Jesus' prayer life. And so we, in, in September, we're going to start the book of Ephesians. But that doesn't mean we should not still continue the habit of devoting ourselves to prayer, both individually and collectively as a group. In fact, we'll build that into the book of Ephesians so that it becomes some part of our DNA, our habit as a church and as a congregation. We're going to continue in prayer, and today we're going to talk about this, hopefully, is this going to work? Something always works. You can do it, right? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Intercession. That's interesting, huh? Did it work? No, okay. I'll just go, and you'll think it's me, it's actually her. Try it now. I ain't doing this. I'll just gonna go like this and you click. <laughs> All right, intercession prayer. Okay, that's why I said we're 95% done. Is this on? Testing. Okay. All right, intercession we're gonna be talking about. Completely, always, and forever. And our primary focus will be in Hebrews chapter 7. But before I get there, we should pray. All right, that makes sense? So let's pray. Father, we wanna thank you, God, um, for all the little mice in our church service, all the little ways that things don't work out well. God, we thank you because it really does lighten up our hearts and spirit, and God, it makes us realize, God, that you are in control, but we're not, and that's actually how life's supposed to be. We thank you for the work of Jesus, what he's done on earth, but also what he continues to do through us now. I pray, Father, for our faith not to waver, but to be encouraged and strengthened this morning. That your spirit really does guide both my words, but also the worship as a whole. Father, I, I thank you for family. Our own personal families, but we also thank you for the family of believers. Uh, we know uh, that we're not perfect. 
But we better start liking each other because we'll have eternity with each other. <laughs> God, I thank you for faith. I thank you for family. And um, Father, we do pray, God, for uh, the Watson family, um, the loss, um, the, um, Rebecca's grandson. We, we pray that your healing hands be um, with them and you comfort them. Father, I pray you be with our family overall together. Uh, we live in a world that has tested us in every which way. As Cecil mentioned, uh, we can easily forget the grace that has been bestowed upon us. And we don't treat others the same way that we have been treated by you. I pray that we can look at Jesus, remember Jesus, and imitate him. And this I pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I want to move around a little bit, but not too much that makes Chuck sweat. So, um, intercession. There it is. What is intercession, right? It's a mediator. Someone who mediates, negotiates. Someone who pleads on your behalf. All right. So, I'm clicking. There we go. Jesus, during his life, would mediate between God and his followers. We've been studying out John chapter 17 for quite a few Sundays. And through that, they actually call this a priestly prayer. It's Jesus sort of pleading for or mediating for on behalf of his own followers, current followers, and his future followers. And then we got some of those things. I wasn't clicking. Oh, did it come up? Oh, okay, sorry. It was, it's working now? Awesome. Wow. Let there be... A remote. I'm not doing that. I wanted to be right there. <laughs> cool, I got it. Right? <laughs> well, just take a picture. You got this, right? I'm sorry I didn't have time to get you guys notes, right? But here, uh, I'll put my notes on Facebook for you so you can have it. You can download it, right? But here you got Jesus, man, what Jesus really wanted. He wanted us to share eternity with him, and he prayed for that. He wanted us to know his father and to know him. He wanted us to, to be protected by his father. All these various different things, you can see it right here. Kept from the, from the evils of the world and, you know, to be made perfect, right, to be sanctified by his word. This is what he's praying to his father. This is his wish for us. And so he mediates between us and his father on earth while he was here with this type of prayer. But then he was crucified and he resurrected and he ascended up to heaven. So now what is he doing? Okay, what is he doing for us now is what I want to talk about. And he's still working. Now, I don't know why this is black because I had it white. Okay. No, that's fine, as long as you guys can see it. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Okay, that's what matters, right? Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He's still working for us and praying for us on our behalf, right? My dear children, I write to this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, which we all do, we have an advocate, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, right? So he's still working on our behalf. So now listen. I'm hoping to really encourage us this morning. But at times you might not feel encouraged. Because I might have to say some hard things. I want you before you text me, I just put the first name in there. <laughs> before you bubble something under your breath, wait till I'm done. So the goal is to inspire and to encourage in us in our prayer life. But there are some things we have to really completely understand to really appreciate what Jesus is doing right now for us. You with me? So I want to talk about the priesthood. See, we're going to talk about Jesus being a priest. That's not Jesus, but he's a priest. And so we're going to talk about the work of Jesus as a priest. You see, Jesus has been given many titles in the Bible and different names. 
And these names are there to help us to understand his character and role in our lives. And so one of them is priest. And priestly, du priestly duties go such as this, right? Their role was to stand before, whether in the tabernacle or in the temple, to stand before God, and they are to mediate on behalf of the people to God. That's their service. They go in and they mediate between God and man, and man and God, right? And they play that kind of middle person to work that. And that's their role. And so they are specifically made holy or set apart for that act of service. And then theirs is an intercessory role. Their role, like I said, is to plead, right? To negotiate, to, to mediate between their relate God and man or man to God. And then once a year, especially when it comes to sin, so daily they would go in and they would offer these different laws. The, the law required different types of sacrifice, and it was all to help the sins of the people. And then once a year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest, okay, would go into the most holy places where he would take the sacrifice and he would pour the blood all over the ark. And that was so that the sins, there's his sins, and the sins of the people can be forgiven. And you got the escape goat, right? That they send out into the desert. And so they had to do this daily, and, and they had to do this annually. Now, the problem is, is that this actually didn't cover sin. This was only a temporary solution. God had a greater plan. So it was sort of like taking the sin and kicking it down the road. The whole idea and the whole purpose was that one day a Messiah will come and he would finally deal with the sins of the people. But until then, this was a, a temporary solution put in place by God. You with me? But what's the problem? The sin still is there. Sin is still the problem. I actually had it over here. Let's see. Let's see if I had it on there. Uh, it's not working. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Can you go back? Yeah, go back. Yeah, sin is still the problem. All right, you guys saw that? <laughs> Write that down. Let's go to the next. <laughs> this is interesting. All right, persistent sins, right? You know, it has a consequence. It has an effect. And we're talking about our prayer life here. And here it says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear, right? God can hear. God has a long enough arm to take care of issues. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So a persistent, consistent sin, no matter how difficult or troubling it is, if it's not dealt with eventually, it dulls the ear of God to our very prayers. And that's a problem, especially since you don't have a full solution to solve the issue. Then there is this issue, right? What happens is that you stop, you stop blushing. That's blush. And what do you use blush for? To cover yourself up, right? <laughs> You're covering it up. You don't even blush. You just you, you just show yourself. You go all natural. Okay? Over time, you imagine that these sacrifices are being done by priests. But what does that do for you? You just kind of hand your, your sheep or goat over, and you walk away thinking this person's done their duties. And over time, we get... Because sin is so persistent in our life, we get used to it. And eventually, it doesn't even bother you anymore. Because it's not dealt with yet. It's not dealt with. So it doesn't really bother you. And then when people start talking to you over time, you start getting like this. Blah, blah. That's what you hear. Blah, 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 blah. Right? So Jeremiah talks about no longer blushing. And Timothy says there's conscience is now seared. It doesn't even bother you. It doesn't even affect you. You don't even try to hide it anymore. Okay? And that's what happens, and that dulls the ear of God. But there's, uh, there's another issue that comes with this, too, right? It's the afflicted conscience. It says, this is an illustration. It's speaking about the temple sacrifice. For the present time, it indicating that the gift and sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. So they gave their sacrifice. They did what they were asked but they still dealt with it on a conscious level. Am I really forgiven? How many times do I got to do this? 
How many times am I going to do this? How many times am I going to mess up? And all of a sudden, you got things like guilt and shame in your life. You have guilt and shame, and the problem with guilt and shame is that you always feel like you're never measuring up. You're always missing the mark. And so this temple sacrifice didn't clear the conscience. And there's that guilt and shame, and you just feel like eventually you can't do it. I can't do it. You get discouraged, and you give up. And that might be a, a vicious cycle. You may say, because I don't want to feel guilt and shame anymore. You may just dive headlong back into the persistent sin. And say, you know what? It's not worth being guilted out. It's not worth living in shame. I'm just going to accept I can't do it. And so, therefore, you embrace the sin. And so there's this vicious cycle that's going on. And it's affecting, sin affects our relationship with God. Sin affects our relationship with one another. It's not about breaking a rule. It's about violating a relationship. That's what sin's all about. It violates, it breaks the relationship between us and God. But also, it also, if we're honest, it hurts our own relationship with one another. And so this is what's going on. And we think, I can't do it. But wait, because there is another high priest that's greater than the priestly, that, the priest that were in the Old Testament and during the days of Jesus. And that's Jesus himself. This is his role. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So you see the previous one, I had the scissor right over the I can't. Because God is saying, you can. I can. Why? Because of what Jesus did. And that's what I want to speak about this morning. What Jesus did. So, number one, Jesus' salvation is complete. It's complete. Let's read this. Now, there have been many of those priests since death, prevented them from continuing in our office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. He's able to save completely. So if you were to take a journey with me back home, and I was to let you in the house, you would see a lot of projects that are incomplete. Okay? I'm just going to walk through some of them right now. Okay, if you go upstairs in the hallway, the carpet, half of it is missing. The other half's there. It's ugly as sin, but it's still there, right? But the other half is not. Why? Because one of my kids vomited in so much. Yeah. It was so much vomit that I was not going to clean that sucker up. So I got wise advice, just cut that thing right out, and I did, right? But I haven't replaced it yet. Because I don't have the money to replace the whole carpet upstairs yet, okay? But not only that, if you walk into my kitchen, my ceiling is not done. I did get it. I got it. I worked on it one time. I was almost done, and then there was a leakage, okay? And so then I was like, ugh. So I lost motivation, so I didn't complete it. But then another leak came, and it was worse than the first one. It was like Noah's flood. And so I had to rip down even more. And so right now, that position, that job is not complete. My beautiful lawnmower, my ride-on lawnmower, that cost me a lot of headache getting it, is broken. And for weeks, it's been in my garage. I'm trying to figure out how to get it back to work properly. I'm almost there, but it's not complete. And in my basement, my basement, we all know a few weeks ago, the little leakage that happened down there, and things, the tiles are up, and the carpets are up, and so I got to fix my basement. It's not complete. And then just yesterday, <laughs> the railing going upstairs was ripped right out of the wall. <laughs> and they're all holes, and they're patched, but they're not sanded or painted. It's incomplete. Bottom line is, I don't know how to solve the problem stopping things being destroyed. I don't know how to solve this problem. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I can't hire someone, and I don't have the, I need to take a month off and take out a loan just to get it, but I don't think that will fix the problem because it's a house, and something else is going to go. I have a furnace that's 22 years. 
told. Okay? So, I got a lot of stuff. My grass is super high because I haven't been able to mow it, right? It's just all these different things. I can't solve the problem. I can't complete the task. But that's not Jesus' problem. See, Jesus, why the other priests could not solve the problem of sin for their nation as mediators, why they failed, is because they themselves are sinful. They can't have the solution. They can't solve the problem because they themselves are a problem. So all they could do is be the best that they possibly can, but in the end, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But Jesus knows how to solve the problem because he's perfect. He was out without fault. And so therefore, he was able to take the problem on himself, right? If I can't fix me, how do I fix you? But Jesus knows how to live for God and know how to be right with man perfectly. And so he can take that problem on. So this is what we face, right? Hopefully we see it. What happened? I had a picture. Yeah, there we go. Cool picture, right? This is us. No matter how good we are, right? Or how churchy we are. Or how morally correct we are. We still can't get over to that other side. Because we don't know how to solve the problem. But Jesus did. His work. And that's why his salvation is complete. Understand? It's completed. I would love to have my house fully completed forever. But it ain't going to happen. But when it comes to the salvation, there's no more kicking the can down the road. There's no more temporary solution. Sin is dealt with forever in the atoning work of Jesus. Okay? You with me so far? Stay with me. Are you encouraged? See, I, I don't know if you saw before, the persistent sin, God's not hearing it. But listen, it's, I'm getting to a point. All right, we're going to continue on. Jesus always is at work, is always working. It says, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted from above the heavens. I love this. Jesus on work in, in on earth said, I am always at my father's business. Right? And in heaven, he's still always at work. But now it's not just his father's business, you are his business. So he always is at work interceding for you and I. Always. You know, I grew up and they told me to never say always and never say never. You guys ever hear that? But there are exceptions to the rule. One, remember this. Jesus, in his atonement work, you don't have to daily come back or annually come back and offer sacrifice. One sacrifice completed the task. It's been completed. And now that sacrifice always works. And he's, he's perfect, right? He's holy, he's blameless, he's pure, he's set apart from sinners. And so he is perfect, and because he is perfect, he's exalted to the high priesthood. And because he's completed the task, he can, and, and he's always working for us, because his one sacrifice covered it, the sin for all, and that the, he's perfect and he's exalted, then he always, always is working for us, and he never, ever will stop. Do you understand? Always and never. You know who else is always and never stops working? This guy right here. I don't know what happened there. That's quick. That wasn't me. Can you guys go back for me? Thank you, thank you. There, Satan. You see, this is what we face. He will always, always accuse. And he never, ever will stop accusing. And that means we're in trouble. Because if you're not in Christ, that man has your number. And he has God's ear when it comes to your number. But if you're in Christ, God, Jesus has God's ear. 
and he speaks on your behalf as an interceder, as a, a mediator, as a pleader for you. You understand? This is what's going on right now. Right now as you're having bad thoughts in your head. It's like, hurry up. <laughs> Get done speaking. Whatever he got in your head, right? And Jesus is like, don't worry, Lord. I, I, you know, I remember my blood, remember my sacrifice, my atoning work. Forgive them of that transgression against Josh. Right? He's always and never. So you've got these two, these forces on both sides who is always working against you and never will stop, but you always have the one who will always work for you and he will never stop. And that's what we have in Jesus and his atoning work. He is always at work for you. So his path, his salvation is completed. It's, it'll never, it'll always be there. It'll, it's complete. It's done. He's always at work for you. And then lastly, which you probably saw before, Jesus is forever. Right? He says, now there have been many of those priests since death, since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He, he sacrificed for their sins once for all. And when he offered himself for the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. He's the perfect lamb and always will be. He's the perfect king, like the divine king, right? He's the perfect sacrifice. He's perfect, and it is forever. It's permanent. What are we building our life off of? The reason why I ask that question is because we put a lot of hope and faith and trust into things that are not permanent, that are not forever. I once someone told me, if it ain't eternal, it's eternally useless. Because death will take it all away. But what we got and what we serve, what we put our faith and trust in is one that is permanent. One that is forever. And that's Jesus. So what does that mean for us? You know, the reason why I kind of give this lesson is because over the years and even as late, there are people who have come to me and they say it's a hard, they have a hard time praying. They have a hard time praying is because they have these things called persistent sins in their life or difficult sins. And they feel like they're getting tired to continue to go to God and talk about these things. Right? But here's the thing. You're right. You are that person. And so am I. We have difficult and persistent and troubling sins that continue to reoccur. If God was to depend on us or use our works as the reason for him to listen to us, then he may have a dull ear towards us. But here's the encouraging thing. He ain't looking at your works. He's looking at the work that his son Jesus did and the sacrifice he made because he is the solution. He solved the problem. And so therefore, though we continue to sin, the scriptures tell us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. So yeah, we're not perfect, but we are righteous because of Jesus' work. And it's, he has God's ear, and he's speaking on your behalf. So whatever you are struggling with and have been struggling for a while, continue to go to God in prayer on it, and don't give up. And ask for his forgiveness, because if you're in Christ, you've been purified. He's got your back. But what about the ones who are guilty and afflicted in their conscience? That was another one. I'm tired of going back to God and talking about the same old thing. And they're starting to feel guilt and shame in their lives. Well, this is what it says. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse what? Our consciousness. Why? Because it's not our works. We understand it's what he did. See, we get guilty consciences and shame when we lose sight of the cross. It's the cross. That's where our trust, our hope is. 
Now, I'm not saying we stamp, we stomp all over the cross and go, well, therefore, I'll just continue to do it. Paul addresses that in Romans chapter sin, 6, right? Since we've, you know, under grace, should I continue on sinning? By no means, right? It's what Cecil was talking about. We get the communion, we come together, we remember what Jesus did, and we respond to his love. It is that love of Jesus that, that controls us that compels us to respond. But you should not have a dirty conscience. It should be clear. Why? Because Jesus, and you have to understand, if you're feeling guilt and shame this morning, don't let that hinder your prayer. Remember the atoning work of Jesus. Go to God. So therefore, as your scriptures say, as I close, totally out. <laughs> don't put it up. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And no matter what it is, don't stop praying. Jesus got your back. Amen. Thank you. All right, I'd like to invite the singers to come on back up. We're going to sing one last song. Then we'll have some announcements. Yeah. Uh, show me the way. Do we have the good stuff? Are you guys nice? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I thought I said that, but yeah, so we can see them. Woman sat by the well. Woman sat by the well and she cried. Woman sat by the well and she cried. Woman sat by the well and she cried. She cried. Oh, show me the way. Show me the way. Show me the way. Okay, clap. Thank you, Becca. Gonna have some announcements. I just have a couple of quick announcements. I don't feel like this works. Does this work? Okay. Um, really quickly, so next week we are back here for our regional worship service. I think Sonny's preaching. Yeah. Woo! Sonny is preaching. Um, 
This week, our midweek, um, we're going to be a uh, regional midweek, and we're going to be talking about some of the things that we, you know, learned from the World Discipleship Summit. So uh, whether you went or not, you know, join, because we're going to just share some highlights from that time. Um, Wednesday, August 31st uh, is the fifth Wednesday of the month, so that's going to be a church-wide Bible Talk Leaders midweek, um, and it's going to be in person. So if you're a Bible Talk leader or you aspire to be a Bible Talk leader, you are welcome to come, and more details will follow. Our next ODAT GPCC cleanup um, in Philadelphia will be Saturday, August 20th at 9 a.m. Uh, location will be announced on, on Wednesday, and as you guys know, Josh is in charge of that, so you can contact him with questions. Um, lastly, a couple of uh, prayer requests. Um, some of you know um, our brother and friend Lou Trippett died at the beginning of the week. Uh, he faithfully finished his race after a long struggle with his health. Details of the memorial service will be announced when they're available. But please be praying for the family, and if you need the address for cards, it's in the newsletter that was sent out via email. Um, lastly, as most of us know, um, Rebecca Watson lost her grandson. Um, baby Tyler, he was four months old. So um, we know Tyler. He was raised in this church, and, you know, his girlfriend, Mickey, um, so please be praying for them. There is going to be a service this coming Friday. Um, we're going to put those details out as soon as those are available, but um, please be praying for them. Um, they are accepting meals at this time, and Zaki and Karen are organizing that so you guys can reach out to them. So that's all the announcements I have, and we're dismissed.